So, in this video, I'm going to try and be optimistic about humanity's future. Out of character, I know, but I kind of have to, to set up this video. I'm going to presume that atomic warfare doesn't happen, overpopulation doesn't happen, killer meteor that destroys everything doesn't happen, we go to Mars, set up a colony or hundred, become a fully fledged spacefaring civilization with bases of operations in different star systems, everything's happy, utopian future, hooray. But I don't need to go around naming achievements to justify how good a civilization is. There's actually a scientific scale to measure how advanced a civilization is, believe it or not. It's called the Kardashev scale, named after Soviet astronomer Nikolai Kardashev, and it measures a civilization based on its total energy consumption per year. Basically, how much energy is needed to keep the society going per year. We are here, and we need to be here for the thing I'm explaining to start to be realised, but you don't know what any of this means, so I'm going to have to explain that first as well. In reality, it's actually quite simple. As a civilization advances in technology, it is also safe to say that the total energy consumption of the society will too. So, we progress up the scale, pretty easy to understand. There are milestones on this scale which define the scale of the civilization. Type 1 here marks a civilization that can use and store energy that reaches the host planet, Type 2 can use and store nearly all energy from a host star, and Type 3 is like Type 2, but for an entire galaxy. This scale is logarithmic, by the way. We use decimals to define the civilizations in between the milestones, just so you know, and just for scale, Type 1 needs 10,000 terawatts, Type 2 needs 10 billion times more than that, and Type 3 needs 100 exawatts of energy, which is a staggeringly huge amount. To measure a civilization, we can use this equation formulated by the one and only Carl Sagan back in whenever he did this. You replace P with the wattage and Q becomes the scale of civilization. As of 2012, the total for humanity is 17.54 terawatts, which if we plug that into the formula, means that our human civilization is a type 0.724 civilization. Decent. Right, so here's the bit I need to be optimistic about. We're going to assume that our civilization will keep growing and growing and growing and eventually become a type 1 and then type 2 civilization, at which point we will need an entire sun's worth of energy to keep us going. But how in the hell are you going to generate an entire sun's worth of energy? Well, you use a sun, of course. Makes sense. And finally, after not too long a time, we get to the Dyson Sphere, you know, the one in the title. A Dyson Sphere is a hypothetical structure a civilization can build around a sun that will transfer virtually the entire output of the star into usable energy. If we are going to progress as a civilization, we're going to have to build something like this maybe in the next few thousand years, well, according to Michio Kaku at least, but he seems like a trustworthy guy. Now, these structures come in a variety of different flavours to suit any civilization's needs. You can have a plain old Dyson Sphere, or instead try Dyson Belt, Dyson Ring, Dyson Swarm, Dyson Hoover, or Dyson Shell, or any combination of these. These are all a little bit different, but I'll explain that later. First, history. history. The concept of a Dyson Sphere dates back to an exciting period in history known as the 1930s. Oh. That's not very exciting. Uh, sorry about that. And anyway, and to a book by this British bloke about sci-fi space travel, where we see our first glimpse of a star-encompassing structure. And, like all good inventions, it's named after somebody else. I guess Stapleton's sphere was just too boring. Skip forward to the 1960s, don't worry, nothing really important happened in between then anyway, and to physicist and mathematician Freeman Dyson. He proposed the same thing that we've just discussed, that civilizations will need stars to power their societies eventually. He then proposed one massive structure could, in theory, surround a star and collect its energy, calling it a shell. He published a paper about it in 1960, and so the Dyson Shell was born, which is exactly like a Dyson Sphere, only less catchy. However, in his paper, he didn't talk about how, in theory, you could build such a sphere, and as a result, I know what you're thinking. A hollow ball enclosing a star. Well, good luck with that. I'm not even going to talk about how hard that would be to design or construct, but instead, to visualise how hard it would be to build, I'm going to talk about how impossible it would be to collect those materials needed to build one in the first place. So, let's make some assumptions. You are going to build one around a star exactly like the sun, with a radius of nearly 700,000 kilometres. The shell itself will have a radius of 0.25 AU, which is 37.5 million kilometres and will be one centimetre thick on average. We are going to ignore which impossible material you might construct it with and use steel as an example, which won't even be the photovoltaic cells themselves, but the frame they sit on, keep that in mind. 
A sphere's area is 4 pi r squared. Plugging in this number, 0.25 AU, gives us 1.76 times 10 to the 22 square meters, the surface area of the sphere. We can fold this out into a flat shape in theory, because there is no perfect representation of the sphere in two dimensions in reality, but we've assumed a lot of things so far, so don't worry about it. Multiplying by 0.01 meters, or 1 centimeter, this gives us 1.76 times 10 to the 20 cubic meters of material needed which is a number that I'm not going to even try to pronounce because this video might last until the next Olympic Games if I do. Go Tokyo, woo. Provided the steel has a 1% carbon content and therefore 99% iron content, and presuming 80% of the Earth's core is iron, we would need 23 Earth cores to supply the iron just to make the frame for one Dyson Sphere. Nearly two dozen planets mined virtually hollow. This is ridiculous, what am I doing with my life? We're going to have to completely obliterate entire solar systems, presuming they have as massive a planetary system as we do, and then transport all of it, every atom, light years, which will cost unimaginable amounts of fuel and time and industry. And then we have to build the bloody thing, which will take hundreds and thousands of years, and then it has to be economically worth all the effort of designing, resource collecting, transport, manufacture, engineering, construction, and maintenance. And assuming all of that, you can finally stand back on what's left of the planet you've gutted, along with many others, and watch as thousands of years and an entire species' work collapses and destroys itself in the star, because there is no physical material anywhere near strong enough to support that kind of structure. Oh well, I guess, back to the drawing board. This is why Freeman Dyson in 2013 stated he wished it hadn't been named after him, probably because most people's interpretations were, quote, physically impossible. But, there is another way. Remember those variants from earlier? Unlike a complete shell, these work by having an orbiting network of structures, like a ring or a disk or a belt composed of smaller, energy-gathering independent satellites. This is the more realistic of the two still very hypothetical concepts. After all, this design has the ability to be added to incrementally, and we are starting to actually develop this tech now. But what about this area? That's wasted energy right there, right? Well, I guess we could try and build more rings there, but we have an underlying problem. This area, where the orbits cross, is incredibly dangerous. Incredibly, incredibly, incredibly dangerous. I'll explain. A lot of people have this misconception about orbits, perhaps led by simplistic diagrams like the one on screen. With the way gravity works, everything is attracted to everything else. There is no outer limit on the pull of gravity. This means a star 500 million light years away is pulling on you right now just by a tiny amount. On a bigger scale, the moon and the sun pull on satellites in orbit, drifting them out of sync with each other. You still have tiny, tiny molecules of gas up that high as well, which drag against the spacecraft and slow it down, which is why the ISS needs to reboost so often. Orbits naturally change, and to calculate how this would happen would be physically impossible. Sure, you can allow for the massive pull of planets, but as soon as the first speck of debris or asteroid gets anywhere near them, they will slightly desynchronize, and this desynchronization will only grow, and if they desynchronize majorly, they might hit each other. And then the millions of shards of debris will hit more satellites, which will hit more satellites, which will hit more satellites, until you have a Kessler syndrome shell of shrapnel traveling many kilometers a second, obliterating everything near that orbit, and rendering that altitude physically unusable for centuries. And according to this video, destruction on that scale will actually cause a recession, the biggest recession in the universe. So yeah, that's something to watch out for. Oh yeah, one more thing. Your civilization now has no electricity, no power. It's basically an apocalypse, so that's fun. However impossible I've made it sound, scientists around the world are trying right now to make it a reality. We as a species have done the impossible before, so why let it phase us? I mean, if another civilization had a couple million years head start, I have no doubt they would be trying to put in place some sort of stellar structure right now. Wait, what? Holy sh**. Holy sh**. Holy sh**. Yeah, that's right, because in 2015, star KIC 84628852 was found by the Kepler Space Observatory to have strange light fluctuations. As far as we know, unique light fluctuations. Fluctuations that would indicate some sort of swarm of spread out orbiting matter very close into the star. A swarm that we've never seen before. 
It is wholly possible that this is our first glimpse of intelligent extraterrestrial life, or at least the shadows of their solar power plant from 1480 years ago. They may be building a Dyson Swarm, one of the more reasonable constructions when trying to power a civilization, but ultimately we will never know for sure. But it's pretty cool, right? So that's the Dyson Sphere, its uses, origins, configurations, and maybe even realisation. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Also, wow, look at that graph. Thanks, guys.